Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. Greetings, great bodhisattvas. How are we this evening? Um, so this, this talk is going to be called The Other Three. Bodhisattva vows. At the uh, the start of every practice session of ours, and at some point in uh, practice session of many groups, uh, I would assume I've only been affiliated with a couple, but uh, the four great Bodhisattva vows are chanted. For us, sentient beings are numberless. We vow to help them all is the first one. And like the Four Noble Truths or any number of other things, people don't get through the first one. It's like they'll hear about dukkha and they'll say oh life is suffering okay done got it and then forget about the other three and with uh the bodhisattva vows i think sometimes we get hung up on the sentient beings are numberless we vow to save them all because numberless and all are pretty big numbers and they might strike us as sort of impossible if we really think about them in a conceptual and logical way, which of course is not the real way. So from the Di Diamond Sutra, uh, I think it's a good idea to pull from that uh, something called, from chapter 17, defining the bodhisattva, so we all know what we're talking about. Then Subhuti addressed the Buddha, saying, World honored one, if good sons and daughters would like to arouse the aspiration for peerless, perfect enlightenment, in what should they mentally abide and how should they gain mastery over their thoughts? The Buddha said to Subhuti, good sons and daughters who want to arouse the aspiration for peerless, perfect enlightenment should think like this. I will save all beings. Yet when all sentient beings have been liberated, in fact, not a single sentient being has been liberated. <clears throat> and why not? Saputi, if a bodhisattva holds the notion of a self, the notion of a person, the notion of a sentient being, and the notion of a lifespan, then he is not a bodhisattva. Why? Saputi, there is actually no such thing as peerless, perfect enlightenment. So, we got that out of the way. But there's those, those other uh, vows that we chant, and I gathered up a few from uh, various and sundry other Zen centers, and uh, San Francisco Zen Center, being or numberless, I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless, I vow to enter them. The Buddha way is insurpassable, unsurpassable, I vow to become it. Um, Quanum Zen Center, sentient beings are numberless, we vow to save them all. Delusions are endless, we vow to cut through them all. <coughs> Excuse me. The teachings are infinite, we vow to learn them all. The Buddha way is inconceivable. We vow to attain it. And that's what we 
uh, chanted here uh, until our uh, teacher Andre Tyson Paolo decided that we would kind of make it a little bit more accessible by using terms like help rather than save. And as the Diamond Sutra tells us, there are no beings to save, there's no savings to be done, no one to do the saving. But how about this other stuff? These other three parts of the vows that we chant. Delusions are inexhaustible. If we sit around and believe all the voices, all the conversations, everything that happens between our ears, that's delusion. That's inexhaustible. That's going to continue on. But we have the aspiration to end them. If we spend too much time on me, 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 I, 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 instead of us, 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 then we're bound by those delusions. And the only liberation from those delusions that can be had is by our own thinking. We create our own delusions, we can end them, we can see through them all, we can cut through them all. There's nothing that says that we have to continue to believe them and act as if they're anything other than empty. Once we realize the teaching of emptiness, we can apply that to the delusions. We can apply it to who's having the delusions. What is this that's having these delusions? Regardless, as the Diamond Sutra would, uh, I'll paraphrase what the Diamond Sutra approach would be, uh, all delusions are no delusions, Therefore, we call them delusions. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. Opportunities to awaken are infinite. We vow to embrace them all. The dharmas are boundless. I vow to master them. The teachings are infinite. We vow to learn them all. Once again, Going back to the Diamond Sutra, let me see if I can uh, find it here. Uh, it's about enlightenment. Okay, chapter seven, no attainment, no teaching. So Woody, what do you think? Does the Tathagata attain peerless, perfect enlightenment? And does he have a teaching that he explains? Sabudi said, as I understand the implications of what the Buddha has explained, there is no determinable phenomenon called a peerless perfect enlightenment. And there is also no set teaching that can be delivered by the Tathagata. Why? The teachings explained by the Tathagata can neither be appropriated nor explained. There is neither a teaching nor a non-teaching. How can this be? All the enlightened sages are distinguished from worldly teachers by unconditioned phenomena. So once again, Dharma teachings. As soon as we conceive of them, as soon as we try and put them into words, we're creating a 
phenomenon that is by its very nature characterized by emptiness. As soon as I think this thought about the Dharma teachings, they're already not the Dharma teachings anymore. Our practice is one of intuitive understanding that's beyond words. We absorb the Dharma teachings. We go through those Dharma gates, those gateless Dharma gates, as has been known. The boundless Un, I don't know, I want to come up with some way of saying unfenced in that's not unfenced in because that doesn't seem to really do much for it. But there are no boundaries around it, hence boundless. Everything we do every day, everyone we come in contact with, every thought we have, gives us the opportunity to awaken. Everything, everything, everything. It's up to us to take advantage of them. Do we get kind of lazy and say, ah, let that opportunity to awaken just slide? Do we approach all the other beings we come in contact with, with the Buddha mind. Do we really want to act as a Buddha when we're given the opportunity? Because that's what an opportunity to awaken is, right? It's the opportunity to be a Buddha. I've been known to say, if you want to be a Buddha, do what a Buddha does. We enter those Dharma gates. We take the opportunities as they're given to us, as we create them for ourselves sometimes. And the fourth one they're all aspirational, right? The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to become it. The Buddha way is unattainable. I vow to attain it. The Buddha way is inconceivable. We vow to attain it. The Buddha way is endless. We vow to embody it. That one, that last one, of course, uh, is ours from the Sangha here. And I think that really sums it up pretty well. The way of the Buddhas is infinite. There's no beginning, no end. It's not characterized by a color, a sound, a smell, a taste. We have to integrate it into our hearts, into our um, our very being, as opposed to this uh, other sort of being that's no being. We have to incorporate it into our, as we might call it, our one mind, because that one mind is the way of the Buddha. And when we say we vow to embody it, that's when we're taking those opportunities to awaken and putting them into practice. We're putting them into practice by our ability to see through our delusional thinking. 
when we get past acting in greed, anger, aggression, all those other um, poisons that we might uh, encounter. And when we're acting as a Buddha because we've entered the Dharma gates and we've cut through the delusions, then we're able to save all sentient beings. And that might be as simple as holding the door open for someone or pushing the elevator button when their hands are full of packages and they need to get to a different floor than the one you're going to.